scheduled to go four rounds. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk this segment about the FCC monitoring and why that's a bad idea for a republic. And, you know, it's interesting. The amount of noise that is coming out of the Ministry of Propaganda is rather stunning. And what I'm, I'm a little disturbed about, however, is the fact that what I haven't seen is them get this riled about virtually anything else that is clearly wrong with our nation. I guess my, my point is, why aren't they this outraged at the president's abuses relating to the National Labor Relations Board and the appointments that he's done in Congress? the unilateral violations of the Congress in, in regard to the lawmaking he's doing, which is lawlessness since the president has no constitutional authority to make any law. With his failure to <clears throat> faithfully execute the laws, which is a direct statement right out of his oath and commitment and job duty description, and this selective prosecution that takes the rule of law and for all intents and purposes throws it out the window because now we don't have an objective law that is applied evenly across the board but it's subjective based upon the whims of whoever is in power major problem ladies and gentlemen so why is it that congress and the press and I, let's just let's leave Congress out of this for a moment because, you know, they're irrelevant anyway. And they clapped at their own irrelevance when the president told them so in the State of the Union address. <laughs> Never heard of such a thing. I was stunned beyond belief. Here's the president notifying Congress that they are obsolete and irrelevant. And he's proudly telling them so. And they are, for all intents and purposes, standing up and clapping. I could not believe it. With a, smile on, with a smile on their faces. So here's my question, though. Why isn't the entire industry so enraged and fired up about all of the other unconstitutional, treasonous abuses that we've sustained, not just from this president in the past five years, but from a whole long line of traitors for the past 20? I mean, I'll give you the Patriot Act from the Bush era. Who spoke out about that? Crickets. Now to make matters worse, the FCC has determined in their infinite wisdom that it is appropriate for them to begin to um, monitor and determine what is in the best needs or what is in the best uh, um, uh, what are, or what are the needs and how are they best met for America by the news organizations? For the record, if this is a new topic for you or you've been hearing about it but you don't really understand it, this is the new FCC multi-market study of critical information needs. Of course, they always give it these innocuous and soft and pleasant sounding names. It's a multi-market study of critical information needs. I mean, who can't get behind that, right? Well, after you understand what it's all about, the last thing you want to be is behind or, frankly, in front of this thing. First of all, their intent, and, and, and here's a major problem, their intent not only on doing this for television and radio, but also newspapers. Well, last I checked, even the traitorous administrative agencies have not delegated to themselves power to regulate newspapers. I mean, they can withhold your television license if you don't do as you're told. They can withhold your radio license if you don't do as you're told. But the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune they don't need a license from the FCC to operate. 
This is, this is known as the CIN study, or SIN, which <laughs> is kind of interesting. That's how it sounds, like SIN. And um, Ajit Pai, or P-A-I, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name. It's A-G-I-T, so I'm pronouncing it Ajit, which I believe is fairly accurate. And P-A-I is his last name. Now, he's one of the FCC's five commissioners. And for the record, these are appointees, right? And by the way, he's one of only, I think, two Republicans that sit on the FCC. The other three are Democrats. And it's kind of interesting because, for one thing, the person who's heading this up happens to be the daughter of an, a very influential Democratic uh, member of the Senate. So it's interesting, though, because he's got a couple of things to say. And he sits on the commission now. There's only five people, right? So, I mean, this is like saying these guys don't have conversations because here he says, this has never been put to an FCC vote. It was just announced, says Pai, one of the FCC's commissioners. I've never had any input into the process. Really? So you're going to try and tell me that the FCC has begun something as invasive as probing the public media to make sure that citizens have all the crucial information that they may need. And three or two or four of the five people who sit on the commission have never heard of it? I mean, this is a pretty world-shaking event for the FCC. They've identified a group of critical need categories, and here's what they are. <laughs> Emergencies and risks and information surrounding those. So that would be, you know, what happens when there's a storm coming? Are you properly notifying the community? How are you mo notifying them that they should evacuate, let's say, in the event of a storm? Health and welfare. Hmm. Let's see. That's pretty broad. The last time we had the government define welfare clause, hmm, they packed almost everything that they are doing that's unconstitutional under that word because, well, it can be used for an enormous range. I mean, are we talking about the welfare of everyone in the country and all of their needs and desires? Kind of interesting. Clyburn, who is the daughter of, the, uh, of House Democratic Rep. James Clyburn, she's been appointed to the FCC, and I believe back in 20, uh, I think 2012, or yeah, 2012, I think. And um, it's interesting because her comment, which, I mean, is, is fairly interesting, says... We must emphatically insist that we leave no American behind when it comes to meeting the needs of those in varied and vibrant communities of our nation, be they native-born, immigrant, disabled, non-English-speaking, low-income, or other. Hmm. That's fairly broad. And when we're talking about health and welfare, so... Are we now going to see the FCC require that radio programs and television programs interject Spanish into their reporting so that, or is, you know, will, will someone have to, you know, translate? You see, their argument is, well, it's only a study. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. But that's a chimera. The real goal here is to get the camel's nose underneath the edge of the tent. And then, utilizing that long and powerful neck, he can lift it up and get the rest of his body through. Information about emergencies and risks. Health and welfare. Education. Hmm. I wonder if they will want to see... Fairness Doctrine Reporting on Common Core. 
transportation, economic opportunities, the environment. Hmm. Interesting. You know, you guys don't have enough stories here about the dangers that coal-fired power plants create for the vast majority of the nation. I can hear it all now. You guys don't do enough stories about the rising tides of the oceans. Then they add in civic information and, here's the really loaded one, political information. It's interesting. We're down to a few minutes, so let me read this for you. This is the FCC wades into the newsroom. It's an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal, and it's by Mr. Pai. News organizations often disagree about what Americans need to know. NBC, MSNBC, excuse me, for example, apparently believes that traffic in Fort Lee, New Jersey is the crisis of our time. Fox News, on the other hand, chooses to cover the September 2012 attacks on the U.S. diplomatic compound in Benghazi more heavily than other networks. The American people, for their part, disagree completely about what they want to watch. But everyone should agree on this. The government has no place pressuring media organizations into covering certain stories. Unfortunately, the Federal Communications Commission, where I am a commissioner, does not agree. Last May, the FCC proposed an initiative to thrust the federal government into, into newsrooms across the country with its, quote, multi-market study of critical information needs, or the CIN. The agency plans to send researchers to grill reporters, editors, and station owners about how they decide which stories to run. A field test in Columbia, South Carolina, is scheduled to begin this spring. For the record, by the way, that's the home district of Clyburn, the other FCC director who happens to be the uh, representative's daughter. The purpose of the CN, CIN, or SIN, according to the FCC, is to ferret out information from television and radio broadcasters about, quote, the process by which stories are selected and how often stations cover, quote, critical information needs, along with, quote, perceived station bias and perceived responsiveness to underserved populations. How does the FCC plan to dig up all that information? Well, first the agency selected eight categories of critical information, such as the environment and economic opportunities that it believes local broadcasters should cover. It plans to ask station managers, news directors, journalists, television anchors, and on-air reporters to tell the government about their news philosophy and how the station ensures that the community gets critical information. The FCC also wants to wade into office politics. One, one question for reporters that will be posed is, quote, have you ever suggested coverage of what you consider a story with critical information for your customers that was rejected by management? Follow-up questions ask for specifics about how editorial discretion is exercised, as well as the reasoning behind the decisions. Participation in the critical information needs study is voluntary, in theory. Unlike the opinion surveys that Americans see on a daily basis and either answer or not, as they wish, the FCC's queries may be hard for the broadcaster to ignore. They would be out of business without an FCC license, which must be renewed every eight years. This is not the first time the agency has meddled in news coverage. Before critical information needs, there was the FCC's now defunct Fairness Doctrine, which began in 1949 and required equal time for contrasting viewpoints on controversial issues. Though the Fairness Doctrine ostensibly aimed to increase the diversity of thought on the airwaves was originally, excuse me, was originally aimed to increase the diversity of thought on the airwaves, many stations simply chose to ignore controversial, controversial topics altogether rather than air unwanted content that might cause listeners to change the channel. 
The Fairness Doctrine was controversial and led to lawsuits throughout the 1960s and the 1970s that argued it infringed upon the freedom of the press. The FCC finally stopped enforcing the policy in 1987, acknowledging that it did not serve the public interest. In 2011, the agency officially took it off the books. But the demise of the Fairness Doctrine has not deterred proponents of newsroom policing, and the CIN or SIN study is a first step down the same dangerous path. The FCC says the study is merely an objective fact-finding mission. The result will inform a report that the FCC must submit to Congress every three years in eliminating barriers to entry for entrepreneurs and small businesses in the communications industry. This claim is peculiar. How can the news judgments made by editors and station managers impede small businesses from entering the broadcast industry? And why does the SIN study include newspapers when the FCC has no authority to regulate print media? Should all stations follow MSNBC's example and cut away from a discussion with a former congressman about the National Security Agency's collection of phone records to offer live coverage of Justin Bieber's bond hearing? As a consumer of news, I have an opinion. But my opinion shouldn't matter more than anyone else's, merely because I happen to work at the FCC. Well, when we see that kind of response from the FCC itself, or at least one individual on the FCC, we can be assured of one thing and one thing alone. That this is another attempt by the federal administration to utilize and abuse the privileges of power in a manner in which they can create a weapon of mass destruction to silence their enemies, their political opponents, those they considered dissidents. I mean, here we are talking about allowing monitors from the government to enter in and query and question reporters themselves. Why didn't you cover that story? Did you bring that to your management? Did they refuse to let you? First of all, let's understand something. The course of action that any corporation who promotes media takes in its distribution of its news and its slant and bias is not a function that government can and or should have any interest and or role in playing. When I say that, I mean I'll give you the example of MSNBC as an example. I don't agree with MSNBC's philosophy but they have a right to continue to do as they do. I don't always agree with CNN or Fox News, but they have the right to have a bias and to promote that bias in their way as, as they see fit. Now, for the government to step in and again try to make Winners and losers, which this government seems to be extraordinarily adept at, number one, finding the losers, but more importantly, extraordinarily adept at exercising abusive authority and interjecting themselves into a position where they are choosing winners and losers. That is never government's role, and definitely not with the media. Now, I'll give it to you right off the bat. Our media is pretty lame. There's very, very little objectivity, and there's even less active investigative journalism. However, irrespective of those issues, it is not government's job or role or position to go into a a news organization, and determine how he can utilize their positioning which makes them vulnerable to his political intimidation. In fact, this one article here in the Washington Examiner says, it's not difficult to see how these topics quickly become vehicles 
for political intimidation. In fact, it's difficult to imagine that they won't. For example, might the FCC standard that journalists must meet on the environment look something like the Obama administration's environmental agenda? Might standards on economic opportunity resemble the president's inequality agenda? The same could hold true for the categories of health and welfare and civic information and pretty much everything else. Pai, being quoted in this article, says, an enterprising regulator could run wild with a lot of these topics. The implicit message to the newsroom is that they need to start covering these eight categories in a certain way, or otherwise the FCC will go after them. So, and I applaud his candor, and I applaud his willingness to come out here and be interviewed on this topic, and to put an op-ed out there, which clearly is going against the grain of the other four commissioners, or at least those who voted for this. The real question is this. <clears throat> Do you trust someone like Kathleen Sebelius to be sitting in a newsroom? Would you trust someone like Eric Holder or any of the attorneys general that he has loaded the entire Department of Justice with who are, quite frankly, dangerous to our nation? Because they don't have an agenda of justice. They have an agenda of social justice. When the rule of law is ignored and objectivity is lost, the news becomes nothing more than government propaganda spewed across the airwaves. And I got to tell you, for the FCC to try to go in there and add newspapers to the mix is particularly disconcerting. First, they have no mandate to control or, or regulate newspapers. And so where they think they get the idea for that also is a very, very telling fact. They're not interested only in radio and television. They're interested in the vast majority of media coverage, and that includes newspapers. That tells you, as a critical thinker, that there's more to this program than meets the eye. Because they don't have any authority to go in there in the first place. And quite frankly, since they don't, for them to include it means that there's a larger agenda. There's a wizard behind the screen, shall we say. <laughs> the Social Solutions Report, who put this report out, this is the Maryland-based company who's um, uh, presented this proposal outlining the process. Um, these are the guys who come up with the interview questions that the, that the monitors have to ask the, you know, the news representatives, the anchors, the whatever. Quote, the purpose of these interviews is to ascertain the process by which stories are selected. That's none of the government's business. <clears throat> they added that news organizations would be evaluated for, quote, station priorities for content, production quality, and population served, perceived station bias, Right off the bat, reg flags should be flying out of every referee's pocket. I mean, we should see an entire swarm of red flags on the play. Perceived percent of news dedicated to each of the CINs, red flags again, and perceived responsiveness to underserved populations. Right now, there should be a blizzard of red flags. Well, the one thing I can say, and we're down to the last seconds of this segment, is that if the FCC goes forward with this, it will, it will be telling because it will tell us whether or not the media is under an enormous amount of coercion to accept this kind of betrayal of the con constitutional principles of the First Amendment or whether they have any backbone left and may someday yet redeem themselves.
There's the big question. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about why your AR-15 may fail and what happens if it fails when you need it the most. We'll be right back. You're listening to America's Voice now. 